Alaska, a remote desert plain in the Peruvian Andes, may hold the key to an ancient puzzle. On January 5th, 1973, we reported the possibility that the lines and figures etched on the mysterious plane marked the site of a landing made by astronauts thousands of years ago. In the early 1950s, translation was begun on a vast library of cuneiform tablets that had been discovered many years earlier in the ruins of the Library of Nineveh, the oldest written record known to science. One passage of the text seems to describe the pyramids of Egypt. There are marks that have been left by past civilizations to indicate the presence on Earth of explorers who came across the divide of space. As we left our tracks on the moon, so too must the ancient astronauts have set theirs on the Earth. If so, where is the evidence of their presence? Where are the artifacts they have left behind? In the ancient world, there were no more accomplished astronomers than the Babylonians. Their cuneiform tablets mark the phases of Venus, the four moons of Jupiter, and the satellites of Saturn. None of these bodies or events can be seen without a telescope, a device invented 3,000 years after the tablets were carved. jump right in. I'm going to start off the list with a very recent find. This just happened last month, which was February of 2024, for those who may be possibly watching in the distant future. A dude stumbled on a massive ancient Roman artifact in a riverbed. It was found in the gravel of the Torre River in San Vito al Torre. Arvino Silvestri was the one who first spotted the ancient artifact and alerted archaeologists. The riverbank was excavated and the archaeologists uncovered a massive block of carved limestone, revealing it to be an ancient Roman funeral monument. It weighed in at a whopping 13,000 pounds and it was in pretty good condition. It's so big and heavy that it required an excavator for transportation. Pretty remarkable find and quite beautiful as well. It has an intricately carved figure of Erotes on one end holding a torch and a poppy flower. Erotes symbolized various things including love and death. The decoration style suggested that the monument was from the high imperial era of ancient Rome but at this point we still don't have an exact date range. At least it hasn't been released to the public yet. Again this is still a very new find but this wasn't all they found either. There was also a stone urn a limestone carving depicting a man's face, and a number of bricks and tile pieces. Next on the list is what I'm just going to call the treasure trove. Now this news just came out last week at the time of recording this video. Archaeologists in Panama unearthed an ancient burial site filled with treasures at El Cano Archaeological Park. The burial dates back between 750 AD and 800 AD and looks like it must have belonged to an elite lord. The burial revealed the remains of a high status man who was likely between 30 and 40 when he died. Aside from bones though, there was a whole bunch of treasure. Breastplates, belts adorned with gold, beads, intricate bracelets, earrings. There were even a pair of crocodile shaped earrings, which is pretty cool. They also found gold covered sperm whale teeth earrings. How extravagant is that? Not only do I have a necklace with whale teeth, but I gotta get them coated in gold too. That's not even all they found. They also uncovered bracelets and skirts made from dog teeth, bone flutes, and a bunch of pottery pieces. And on top, of all the beautiful stuff this guy was buried with, he was also accompanied by a number of people who were sacrificed. He was incredibly rich, so he was just too above going into the afterlife alone. Next on the list, we have a horrifying pit of severed hands. Apparently severed hands were a big deal in ancient Egypt. Archaeologists made a pretty gruesome discovery when they came across pits filled with severed 
human hands. They were found during excavations of a palace near the ancient city of Avaris. These pits contained hundreds of severed hands, neatly stacked together, and the largest pit was right in front of the throne room. Researchers believe that these hands were severed from enemies captured in battles or raids. It's not entirely clear why these hands were collected and stored, but there have been images found of soldiers trading severed hands for gold. So some speculate that they might have been offerings to the gods or simply just trophies of victory. Next up, we have the Herxheim archaeological site. So back in 1996, during routine excavations, archaeologists came across this pit filled with human remains. Now, that's got to be alarming even for an archaeologist. I can't imagine you ever get bored with finding human remains, but what made this find even creepier was how these folks had died. They weren't just the remnants of ordinary burials. There were signs that these people had been deliberately and systematically consumed by other humans. The bones all showed signs of butchering. Cut marks indicated careful dismemberment. It looked like these individuals were not just victims of violence, but also of ritualistic consumption. The pit contained the bones of over 500 people, dating back to the Neolithic period. Some suggest these folks were eaten as part of some sort of religious ritual, but other researchers think this may have been more a case of desperation. Possibly there could have been a famine. Next up, we have Neanderthal markings. So the recent discovery of ancient cave markings thought to be made by Neanderthals is obviously pretty exciting. The markings were found on the walls of a cave in central France and are believed to be over 57,000 years old, which would make them the oldest of their kind. The cave was first stumbled upon in 1846 during some quarrying work. It wasn't until 1912 that the archaeological finds started cropping up though, with a discovery of animal bones and tools that had likely belonged to Neanderthals. The cave seemed to have been sealed off from the outside world around 57,000 years ago, which is a hefty chunk of time before before modern humans even set foot in the region around 42,000 years ago. So it's a solid bet that the finger marks on the walls were the handiwork of Neanderthals. So, so what are these markings exactly? They're a series of wavy lines, dots, and faint striations, and it's believed that Neanderthals created these engravings by sweeping and pressing their fingers across a thin line of film on the limestone walls. The height of the markings suggests they were made by taller beings, teenagers or adults, but you know, were they decorative, ritualistic, were they even made intentionally? They're still not sure. Now we head back to Egypt with the discovery of an ancient Roman city in Luxor. The news about this incredible find was announced back in January of 2023. Egyptian archaeologists found a very well-preserved Roman city in Luxor, dating back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries CE. It's now been described as the oldest and most important city found on the eastern bank of Luxor by Mustafa Waziri, head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities. The archaeological team unearthed a whole whack load of these ancient structures, including residential buildings, offering insights into how people lived during that time. There were also the discovery of two pigeon towers used for housing carrier birds, meaning this city was very likely involved in communication networks at the time. There were also metal workshops found in the city that contained whole collections of artifacts of their own, pots, tools, and a collection of bronze and copper Roman coins. Next up, we have the 4,500-year-old tomb. This is another recent 2024 archaeological discovery. I really tried to fill this list up with new stuff. So this discovery was made about 20 miles south of Cairo. Egyptian and Japanese archaeologists stumbled on an ancient Egyptian tomb carved into rock over 4,000 years ago. I always say stumbled on. Like these archaeologists are just kind of walking around and they're like, oh, it's an ancient tomb. Obviously, there's more that goes into it than that. It's just the easiest way for my brain to wrap my head around it. They stumbled on it. So anyway, the tomb was carved into rock over 4,000 years ago, dated back between 2649 and 2150 BC. The tomb contained a whole bunch of graves and artifacts from different historical periods. During their excavation, the team unearthed a bunch of treasures. There were human remains buried alongside a vividly colored mask, a burial site from the Second Dynasty, and an incredibly well-preserved alabaster vessel from the 18th dynasty. In the tomb, there were also two terracotta statues depicting the ancient Egyptian goddess Isis and Harpocrates, along with a stela with a man's name encrypted on it, a man named Heroides. Heroides. 
think that's how you pronounce it. You've all heard of the Moe statues on Easter Island before, I know, but just last year, archaeologists found a new one. This new statue adds to the nearly 1,000 that have already been found on the island. This latest statue was uncovered in a dry lake bed, the only one to be found in that location. So far, anyway. The discovery was made by the organization that oversees the island's national park. Terry Hunt, a professor of archaeology at the University of Arizona, was incredibly excited about the find and described how important it is that these statues be retrieved, helping to preserve the history of the Rapa Nui people. So with how much attention and research has gone into the Easter Island statues, why was it that this one was just discovered now? Well, they're saying it's probably because of changes in the area's climate resulting in the drying out of the lake that was surrounding the sculpture, and they're thinking it probably won't be the last one to turn up. Next, we have another exciting discovery. News about this came out just recently as well. A ton of cool artifacts were found in Brazil. And this one's pretty cool because this stuff was discovered completely by accident. This really was like stumbling on it. So there was a routine construction project going on at an apartment complex, but then construction workers came across a pretty alarming find, human bones, and then more and more stuff started turning up. There were also pottery shards, so these bones weren't recent. Turns out all this stuff belonged to an ancient civilization dating back as far as 9,000 years ago. During excavations, they found thousands of artifacts, and not only that, but these artifacts could possibly reshape the understanding of human settlement in Brazil. The site known as Roseanne's Farm was full of stone tools, ceramic fragments, decorated shells and bones, which was excavated over the course of four years of intense digging. And in total, 43 human skeletons and more than 100,000 artifacts were uncovered. Archaeologists unearthed remnants of a group that existed around 8,000 to 9,000 years ago, meaning that humans moved into the region much earlier than previously believed. The leader of the excavation stated the discovery could, quote, completely change the history of not just the region, but all of Brazil. End quote. This finding may totally change the way we look at the timing and the roots of human migration into the Americas from Asia, which is pretty cool. And we're finishing off the list with the finding of a mysterious Anglo-Saxon artifact, again just in January of this year, in Langham, England. A treasure hunter made a pretty cool discovery with a metal detector. It was a small artifact made of gilded silver. It was just under an inch in diameter and 0.3 inches in height. Apparently it dates back to the 8th century. It also has an image of an animal engraved on top, along with Celtic knot-like patterns. Not entirely clear what the object is. The portable antiquities scheme, who are responsible for recording finds like this, noted the thing is similar to other items discovered in the same time period. But this one stands out because of its size and its design. Historian Helen Giak speculated that the spiral pattern on the artifact looked a lot like Celtic designs, and that the animal depicted could be a horse. Definitely what it looks like to me as well. She also praised the craftsmanship, noting that it was created by someone with a keen eye for beauty. And again, I agree. That thing, it looks fantastic. Is off with, with a 3,000 year old arrow. This is a super recent discovery, it just happened back in September. A glacial archaeologist archaeologist named Espen Finstad was hiking through the Jotunheim Mountains in eastern Norway when he came across a wooden arrow. It was so well preserved that to the naked eye, it would probably look brand new. It even still had feathers on it. But Finstad estimated that this arrow was actually around 3,000 years old. He later determined it was likely used by a hunter in the late Stone Age to early Bronze Age. Finstad stated, what makes the arrow so impressive is its preservation. Though it is broken into three parts, the arrow remains attached to the shaft, as do the feathers, known as fletchings, which help to stabilize the arrow's flight path. So this is just one of the many artifacts turning up, uh, once frozen under you know thick layers of ice, you know, not just in Norway, but in cold climates all around the world as glaciers continue to melt. If you are enjoying our content so far, if you're new here, hit that subscribe button and don't forget to leave your thoughts, uh, your comments, complaints down below. Uh, I'll usually read them.
At number nine, we have Mami Juanita. Mami Juanita, also known as the Ice Maiden or Lady of Ampato, is an exceptionally well-preserved mummy of an Inca girl which was discovered in 1995. The mummy was found on Mount Ampato, a dormant volcano in the Andes Mountains of southern Peru, by anthropologist Johann Reinhard and his team. Mummy Juanita is believed to have lived during the Inca Empire, making her one of the best preserved ancient bodies ever found. She was approximately 12 to 14 years old at the time of her death. The mummy was found at an altitude of about 20,600 feet, and her discovery was kind of accidental. Reinhard and his team were actually on a mission to recover another Inca mummy when they stumbled on her in a crevice. She was wrapped in several layers of colorful textiles and buried with various offerings, including ceramic and metal objects, food items, and small statues. She's probably sacrificed as an offering to the Inca gods. The mummy is currently on display in the Catholic University of Santa Maria's Museum of Andean Sanctuaries in Peru. Uh, you know, so get over there immediately. Tap on her glass encasing and uh, tell her Uncle James said hello. First person in the comments to do that will receive a, a wink emoji from me and a $10 gift certificate to Walden Books. Number eight, the mammoth mummy. No, this is not a giant sized human mummy. That would be pretty awesome. This is pretty awesome too, but it's, it's a mummified woolly mammoth. In 2010, a team of Russian scientists found a well-preserved mammoth in Siberia, later named Yuka. She was a young mammoth, about six to eight years old, and lived around 39,000 years ago. Yuka's body was in really good shape. Its body measured about two and a half meters in length, and it was remarkably intact with her trunk, bones, some of her flesh, hair, and even eyes still preserved, making her one of the most well-preserved mammoth specimens ever found. It's pretty incredible to see, not that I've ever seen it uh, in person, but based on pictures and video that I have seen of it, uh, crazy how well-preserved it is. Finding a dinosaur in this condition would be absolutely unreal. Anyway, they think she might have fallen into a mud pit or drowned, which helped to uh, preserve her so well. People probably butchered her for meat as there were cut marks on her bones. Scientists studied her DNA to learn more about mammoths and their connection to modern elephants. Right now, Yuka is currently being held in Moscow. Next up, we have the Greenland Norse textiles. Uh, these textiles are a collection of ancient fragments discovered in 1921 in various archaeological sites in Greenland. The textiles provided insights into the types of clothing and weaving techniques of the Norse settlers who lived in Greenland during the medieval period. The sites where these fabrics were found are part of the remnants of Norse settlements in Greenland, which thrived between the 10th and 15th centuries. Fabrics discovered include include woolen garments and household items. They were remarkably well preserved due to the cold and dry climate of Greenland, which helped prevent decay. The textiles had a bunch of different weaving patterns, colors, and designs that reflected the skill and artistry of the Norse weavers back in the day. It's interesting to see what their clothing looked like beyond depictions of them in ancient artwork. These fabrics uh, have also been useful in understanding the challenges faced by the Norse settlers in Greenland and how they adapted to the harsh environment. And at number six, we have the Kostenki 17 artifacts. The Kostenki 17 artifacts were discovered at the Kostenki site in Russia, an archaeological site known for its wealth of Upper Paleolithic finds. The artifacts discovered at the site include bone and antler tools, bone ornaments, and various artifacts made from organic materials. Archaeologists dug up a number of bone and antler tools, like spear points, knives, and needles, tools that had been crafted with remarkable precision. They also found ornaments made from bone like beads and pendants. On top of that, there were plenty of hunting tools like projectile points along with bones of animals that they had hunted. Some other notable discoveries at the site were engraved objects and fragments. These engravings often depict animals in geometric uh, patterns, showcasing the type of artwork they would have made at the time. At our number five spot, we have the Siberian Ice Maiden, also known as the Princess of Ukok or the Altai Princess. 
This is a mummy of a young woman that was discovered in 1993 in the Ukok Plateau, the Altai Mountains in Siberia. The Siberian Ice Maiden was discovered by Russian archaeologist Natalia Polosmak in a tomb on the Ukok Plateau. The site was located in an altitude about 8,200 feet. The mummy is believed to date back to around 500 BC, making her approximately 2,500 years old. The mummy was found in a wooden sarcophagus covered with felt blankets and a cowhide rug. She was dressed in intricately woven garments made of wool and felt that was also adorned with jewelry, you know, earrings and necklace, various ornaments made of gold and other precious metal. So it's likely she held a high social status within the community. Her burial seemed to have been part of a complex ritual too, which led the archaeologists to believe she could have been a priestess or a noblewoman. Number four, the Etherican brown bear. 2019, scientists uh, made a pretty cool discovery in Siberia. A thousands year old brown bear carcass preserved in the permafrost. The ancient brown bear carcass was discovered by reindeer herders. It was incredibly well preserved because of the permafrost conditions which prevented decay. The carcass dates back approximately 3,500 years, placing it in the late Bronze Age. This age estimation was made through radiocarbon dating, a technique used to determine the age of organic materials based on their content of carbon-14 isotopes. Next on the list is Quede Dan Shinichi, which which was the name given to a remarkably well-preserved body discovered at the Tachanshini Alaska Provincial Park in British Columbia, Canada. Quede Dan Shinichi was discovered by hunters in the remote wilderness northwestern British Columbia. The body was found partially buried in the ice, surrounded by a variety of artifacts. He was believed to have lived over 550 years ago, around the early 15th century, a member of one of the indigenous tribes that inhabited the region during that time. The body's preservation was due to the glacier ice, which acted as a natural freezer, protecting the remains from decomposition. And along with the body, again, a variety of artifacts were discovered. There was a robe made from animal hides, a spruce root hat, a woven mat, a walking stick, various tools made from stone and bone. The body was then ceremonially reburied in 2000, following traditional rituals and protocols. Coming in at number two, we have the Landbrine tunic. In 2011, during archaeological excavations in Landbrine, Norway, this ancient piece of clothing was discovered. The tunic was a remarkable archaeological find, revealing more information about ancient Norse clothing and textile techniques. The Landbrine site in the mountains of Norway was once frequented by travelers during the Roman Iron Age, approximately 300 to 500 AD. Because of the ice and snow in the region, many artifacts including textiles have been incredibly well preserved and the tunic it's made of wool dates back to around 230 AD. It's a tunic style garment with a natural brown color, a simple design. It has a twill weave, a pattern commonly used in textiles in that era. Just think of how much of our clothing, by the way, is going to be left behind after we eventually leave Earth or go extinct, let alone all our other crap. We churn out so much stuff on a constant basis, more so than at any point in history. I think finding stuff from this era is going to be so common in the future that it'll be more of a new rather than a remarkable find. Finally though, taking that number one spot is Otzi the Iceman. Now, why is this number one? I don't know, not really any particular ranking going on here, just uh, a good one to close off with. In September of 1991, hikers Helmut and Erika Simon stumbled upon a well-preserved human corpse high in the Alps near the border of Austria and Italy. Later known as Otzi the Iceman, the two hikers saw the remains and actually thought he could have died relatively recently. But no, Otzi was an ancient human who had lived over 5,000 years ago during the late Neolithic period. He was so well preserved because he'd been encased in ice for that thousands and thousands of years. His body was found in the Otzel Alps. The discovery site was in the Schnalzalval Sinalis Valley, a region that was once covered by glaciers completely. Scientists discovered that Otzi lived between 3359 and 3105 BCE, making him one of the oldest and most well-preserved naturally mummified humans 
ever found. He was five foot five and weighed around 110 pounds. The age at the time of his death was estimated to be around 45 years old. Besides his body, researchers also found a bunch of artifacts and clothing items with him a copper axe, a quiver of arrows, a bearskin cap, and a coat made of woven grass and hide. Otzi's remains and belongings are currently housed in the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Balzano, Italy. The Dendera Lights. When was the first light bulb invented? Well, it was way after the Common Era calendar started, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe the ancient Egyptians had some hookups for light bulbs and they used to throw dope raves. The Hathor Temple in Dendera, Egypt has carvings in the wall which look like gigantic light bulbs. The Egyptians may have found a way to harness some sort of energy to make light bulbs. If we're going to go super conspiracy theory, which we are, some people believe that the pyramids were actually power plants with copper wires inside of them. They used them to tap into the natural electrical energy floating around the atmosphere, pull it down into the earth, and send it into surrounding cities. If this is true, my Egyptian rave theory is not that far off. Number 9. Robots? We barely have robots now, and you're telling me that before they had toilet paper, they were making robots? Well, not that high tech, but it's still pretty cool. In ancient Greece, Philion of Byzantium made a working maid. The way this contraption worked, it was a statue with moving parts. It was perfectly weighted with a pitcher in one hand and the other hand was open. When you placed a cup in the open hand, it would shift the weight of the statue, causing it to move and pour the pitcher into the cup. Basically the best bartender ever. He'll never cut you off. This was one of the only artifacts like this, so it's most likely that robots weren't commonplace back then. It was probably only the super rich ancient Greeks that could afford it. This robot was the 8K TV of its day. Number 8. Turkish Gilding over 8,000 years ago, the Turks were balling. They were putting gold on everything. They put gold on your house, gold in your chairs, gold on your baby. I don't know if that last one is true, but it was 8,000 years ago. I'm sure someone had to try. Who wouldn't want to put gold on a baby? That'd be dope. You have a golden baby. The Turks would use mercury to perfect this gilding process, and they were so good at it that we still haven't figured out how to do it to this day. It's 8,000 years later, and with all the technological advancements we have now, we still can't find out exactly how they did it. Maybe it was aliens. Maybe the alien version of Bobby Shmurda came down and helped them put gold on everything. Number 7. Lunar Tack Disc when you think of Vikings, you think of pillagers, murderers, pointy hats, but they were also some of the best sailors alive. They were kings of navigating the sea, pulling up on some foreign shore and cutting everyone's head off. So it shouldn't be a huge surprise that they might have been the first civilization to discover a compass. The lunar tack disc was discovered in Greenland in 1984. It's believed that the Vikings would use these devices at night when they couldn't use the sun to navigate. It's not certain how these devices would work, but it seems they would give the user a rough idea of where the sun would be in the sky after it was set. The lunar tack disc would work in parts with other things like wooden slabs and crystals. I never thought bloodthirsty vikings would be into crystals. You come home after a long day of mass murder and your wife's like, whoa, your chakras are all over the place. Number 6. The Bell I don't know if you know this, but coal takes at least 30 million years to form. That's why this next one is pretty interesting. This one is a brass bell which was discovered encased in a chunk of coal. The coal that the bell was encased in was over 300 million years old and the mine that the bell was found in was over 100 feet deep. The bell also had carvings which were similar to the Hindu god Garuda, but the bell was discovered in West Virginia. How did a brass bell with Hindu god carvings encased in 300 million year old coal end up in West Virginia? These are so many questions, but it might be signs of advanced civilizations existing in North America way before we think. Number 5. The Puri Reis Map Cartography is pretty easy now that we have satellites. We can see the whole world from space and just take a picture and then print out the picture. But then the printer's like, I can't print it, I'm out of color. And you're like, whatever, just print in black and white. And he's like, nah, I need more magenta. And you're like, I said black and white. Believe it or not, 
making maps was even harder back then. The Puri Reese map was discovered in 1929 by Gustav Adolf Deismann, and it was an absolute marvel. The map depicted a very detailed charting of Antarctica before it was covered with ice. It was made by cartographer Haji Ahmed Muhiddin Puri. The map is so incredibly detailed that it puzzled the archaeologists that found it. Who was able to make something this detailed without some sort of advanced technology? Also, we can't compare it to what Antarctica would look like because it's now covered in ice. So, we'll just have to wait to find find out if it's actually accurate. Number 4. The London Hammer This isn't some bad 80s hair metal band. This is the discovery of one of the oldest dated tools ever. The London Hammer was discovered by a couple who went out for a walk and they saw a chunk of wood coming out of a rock. They thought it looked interesting enough so they took it home. Later, their son decided to take a hammer and chisel to it and break into it. Inside, he found what looked like a crude design of a hammer. They took the hammer to some archaeologists and this is where things get crazy. The rock encasing the hammer dates back 400 million years and the iron used to make the hammer's head is over 500 million years old. The hammer's head is over 90% pure iron so there's no way this could have happened naturally in nature. Parts of the hammer's handle have been turned to coal which means the hammer itself is at least 30 million years old because the coal takes at least 30 million years to form. My guess is someone jumped into a time machine and got stuck way back. Never be the first guy to go into a time machine. Wait until they work out the kinks. Number 3. The Coso Artifact in 1961, a group of hikers was going rock collecting somewhere in the California mountains. These guys were super cool dudes. They came across some geodes which are crystals encased in rock. They took them home to cut into them to see what kind of crystals would be inside. What they found was more than just crystals but a porcelain casing, a spring and some metal parts encased inside the rock. The pieces all resembled a spark plug but the rock was dated 5,000 years old. The craziest part about this is the Kazo artifact and the three hikers who made the discovery have all gone missing. Super creepy. Number 2. Nuclear Reactor How old would you think the first ever nuclear reactor is? If I told you it was 10,000 years old, you probably wouldn't believe me. Well, this nuclear reactor discovered in Gaboon, Africa is actually way older than that. In 1972, a team of archaeologists dug up a 1.8 million year old nuclear reactor. They were able to determine the age through carbon dating and from the design it seems like it was man made. This is one of the craziest discoveries ever recorded. Some people think that it was a meteor that crashed into the earth and just left back some nuclear energy. But other people think that it was aliens who came here to bioengineer humans and create new life and then study it from a distant planet. I don't know. And maybe everyone's wrong. Maybe some people are right. I don't know. Number one, spheres. If you find one naturally occurring anomaly, you can chalk it up to chance. But if you find over 200 in the same place over a 30 year period, then I guess there might be something going on. Metallic spheres started popping up in a mine in South Africa in the 1970s. There were metal on the outside with some line markings that go down the center. They range from sizes of 2.5 centimeters to 10 centimeters. If you break into them, they seem to have some sort of soft material in them that breaks down when it comes in contact with the air. So far it's not that crazy. But these spheres are dated back 2.8 billion years before dinos. Before almost anything, how could you have something that's clearly crafted dated so old? Obviously, I don't have the answer, but we can speculate. Time travel? Aliens? Maybe this is human beings second run at life. Maybe there's been civilizations that have lived on this planet before and we're just another group taking a shot at life. Starting well, us off today, we have Yonaguni Formation, also known as Japan's Atlantis, discovered in the 1980s just off the coast of Yonaguni Island in Japan. The formation is a massive underwater rock structure coming in at more than 50 meters, 165 feet long, and 20 meters, 65 feet wide. Some people have speculated that the monument is the lost city of Lemuria, the home of the lemurs, which is argued to be at least 5,000 years old. On the other hand though, many scientists maintain that the structure occurred naturally, shaped only by the currents of the ocean. Personally, I just can't get behind that. I mean, this thing has steps, and the last time I checked, erosion doesn't create such sharp angles. It should be noted, however, that this thing is made out of solid rock and not bricks. So to carve it all out and to shape it into what it is today would have taken the peoples of Lumeria hundreds of years to do. So what do you guys think? 
think? Let us know. Next up, we have an ancient shipwreck in which a 15 meter, 49 foot boat was discovered, which is estimated to have sailed over 2,000 years ago for the Roman Empire. The discovery, which was made in October of 2014 off the coast of Italy, is believed to have either been a merchant ship or a military vessel. Regardless of what it was, though, one thing is for sure it must have been packed with olive oils and fine wines, as the area in which the wreck was found was absolutely littered with hundreds of terracotta pots that would have been used to store such delicacies at the time. The ship is estimated to have been an active transport vessel making its way back and forth between Rome and Carthage way back in 218 to 210 BC. Next on the list we have a series of ancient Egyptian artifacts discovered in the area in which the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean Sea. The discovery which was made by Frank Gorio in 2000 included 250 ancient artifacts, two of which were enormous granite sculptures, one of a pharaoh and the other of an Egyptian god, Hapi, spelt H-A-P-I, who was said to have kept the soils of Egypt fertile by annually flooding the Nile. The discovery has excited researchers as it has been linked to two sunken cities, Canopus and Thonis, which are said to have rumbled into the sea in the latter half of the 8th century after a series of natural disasters. Upon further investigation of the area, it also appears as though a canal had existed that would have connected the now underwater cities to the second largest city in the country, Alexandria. Next up we have the Antikythera wreck, discovered on the east side of the Greek island Antikythera, which gave way to two very significant scientific, historical, and archaeological discoveries, one of which is referred to as the Antikythera mechanism, which is an ancient Greek ore used to predict the relative positions and motions of the planets and moons in order to identify events such as solar and lunar eclipses. As the artifact has been dated all the way back to somewhere around 100 BC, it is an extremely advanced piece of technology and is recognized as the very first example of an analog computer. The second rare find made at the wreck site was none other than a human skeleton. And the reason this is so incredible is because of the fact that human remains are almost never found at the site of shipwrecks, especially ones this old, due to scavengers, ocean currents, and natural decomposition making the body disappear. Finding the 2,000 year old skeleton buried under ocean sediment gives scientists an opportunity to push the boundaries of ancient DNA analysis and provide information about both heritage and ancient diseases. Alright guys, I'm gonna say something but I need you to be mature, okay? Because next on the list we have an underwater temple, the remains of an ancient lost city located in Lake Itikaka. Get over it. The remains were discovered in 2000 by an international archaeological dive team along the border of Bolivia. Bolivia and Peru at an estimated depth of 281 meters, around 929 feet. The temple is estimated to be between 1,000 and 1,500 years old, meaning it would have existed during the time of the Tiwa Naku people, before the Incan civilization was ever even formed. Found among the ruins were many golden artifacts, but perhaps the most interesting find was the long roads and terraces designed for growing crops that give archaeologists and historians some great insight into the agricultural understanding of not only the Tiwaneku people, but any person living between the year 500 and 1000 in the area. And next we have, surprise, another underwater city, specifically the underwater city of Port Royal, located in Jamaica and commonly referred to as the Sunken Pirate City. The area is known to be one of the most wicked places on earth due to the fact that at one time it was completely overrun by pirates who pillaged the town, causing chaos, destruction and devastation. Once considered the most important trading post in the New World, the city fell to the seas at exactly 1143 on June 7th in 1692 due to a massive earthquake which was quickly followed by a gigantic tsunami. The city sunk in less than two minutes and it is the only known sunken city in the Western Hemisphere. Next we have a 900 year old crusader sword recovered from the Israeli seafloor off of the coast of northern Israel in 2021. Not by scientists or historians, but rather a recreational diver who decided to take a solo dip in the country's temperate waters. Which I do not recommend, by the way. If you go diving, please bring a buddy.
Society. Although the iron artifact was found covered in corals and shells, its shape was a dead giveaway to Shlomi Katzen, who knew it had to be something cool. Katzen turned the item over to experts who used an advanced x-ray machine that allowed them to view the item beneath its oceanic crust. Now, if you're starting to think the thick layer of ocean sediment, corals, and shells has become a bit of a nuisance in the process of recovering, identifying, and presenting this sword, you should know that this layer is the only reason for the sword being around today. As without it, the iron would have dissolved hundreds of years ago and there would have been no sword to find. Hold on to your heads because this next one is one. A bronze one, that is. Think about it. Now think about the fact that you're thinking about it. It's a philosopher's head. Well, a statue of one. Presumably Pythagoras of Samos. And why does that name sound familiar? Well, because a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and the square root of a squared plus b squared equals c. But let me stop torturing you with math, and we can get back to the square root of this discovery. The head, which was determined to have been forged during 500 BC, was discovered off the coast of Sicily in Italy, but it is said to have belonged to the Greek. This discovery has raised many questions about how it came to be washed along the shores of the Italian region, and researchers are now keeping a close eye on the area in hopes of discovering more ancient artifacts like this one. And that brings us to New Jersey's mysterious underwater locomotive graveyard, discovered in 1985. The two engines were found at a depth of about 27.5 meters, 90 feet, and are believed to be over 100 years old. The locomotives were identified as Class 2 to 2T, to which apparently is super rare, as they usually remain in train yards and are hardly ever used for transportation. So how did they go from not leaving the lot to ending up in the ocean? We have no idea, as there are zero records regarding their disappearance. Some researchers believe that they were lost at sea while being shipped from Boston to New York, perhaps due to a treacherous storm or high waves, but again, no records. Not only that, but the way in which the engines sit, one directly behind the other as if they were making their way down a railroad track, has left historians just downright confused about the discovery. And in the number one spot, we have Queen Anne's Revenge. Some of you guys already know this, but I grew up pretty close to where the Pirates of the Caribbean was filmed, so I'm super excited for this one, as the Queen Anne once belonged to the most infamous pirate who ever lived, Blackbeard. And no, he's not just a character from the franchise. Blackbeard, whose real name was Edward Teach, lived between 1680 and 1718, and was based in none other than Port Royal. In 1717, Blackbeard got his hands on a Bristol-built ship named Concord, which he changed to none other than the Queen Anne's Revenge. Now, if you're paying attention, you'd notice that based on the dates, Blackbeard would have had possession of the vessel for a year tops. Well, it was actually less, as on November 22nd of 1718, in a drawn-out battle, Blackbeard was pew, five times and tch, tch, more than 20 times. After his passing, the Queen Anne became property of Captain Thatch, under whom she met her surprisingly uneventful end. After becoming beached on an underwater sandbar near Beaufort, North Carolina, eventually sinking as the water levels rose and the sand fell away. The vessel was rediscovered November 21st of 1996, literally one day before the anniversary of Blackbeard's death, by a private research team in Beaufort Inlet. While you are able to visit the site of the wreck, if you can call it that, it's important to note that it is a working underwater archaeological site, so doing so would require one and a half days of educational training, but I say it's worth Ten, it. Ten, the toy monkey. So it goes without saying that almost everything that is a notable part of the Conjuring series is also a real artifact that the Warrens found along the way. One of these such artifacts, who made an appearance in both The Conjuring and the spin-off Annabelle Comes Home, is the Toy Monkey. However, if it wasn't already obvious, it's not something to be played with. As Ed tells the reporters in The Conjuring movie, everything you see here is either haunted, cursed, or been used in some kind of ritualistic practice. Nothing is a toy. Not even the toy monkey. So what exactly makes this monkey so scary in real life? Well, allegedly, it is possessed by a terrifying demon who enjoys stalking its victims before eventually killing them. So, yeah, not a very nice monkey, it seems. Although, nothing you'll find in this museum is terribly friendly. Coming in at number nine, a vampire coffin. As far as creepy looking things go, I have to say this is not one of the scariest looking on the list, but of course, 
things are not always what they appear. This coffin found at the Warrens Museum is not just called the Vampire Coffin because of the slightly goofy looking Count Dracula face on the top, but because it was allegedly actually used by a modern day vampire. Now, I'm not saying that this is fictional, but I will say that the details surrounding this are rather few. There is no file stating how modern this modern vampire was or how it came to be in their possession, but I mean, it's definitely very intriguing. My only question is, where is this so-called vampire now? Was it killed or is it roaming free? Should we be nervous that a bloodthirsty monster could be on the loose? Or was it more of a twilight vampire situation? I guess we will never know. Coming in at number eight, the famous music box. If you have seen The Conjuring, which by the way, if you haven't, you really should, then you will definitely recognize this next item here. In the film version of the story, the youngest child of the family, April, finds an antique music box in the house and uses it to communicate with the spirit of a young boy named Rory, who was supposedly killed by his mother, Bathsheba, in the 1800s. Now, of course, there are definitely larger things at play throughout the film, but at the end of it, viewers see Ed place the haunted music box inside of the room of artifacts, where it suddenly opens and begins to play its tinny music. Now, in real life, it didn't quite happen like that, but the real music box is safely tucked away in the Warrens Museum. However, legend has it that while it really does contain an evil spirit, it was not properly contained, and so some believe the demon could escape at any moment. Coming in at number seven, tombstones. When it comes to items involved in a satanic ritual, I am sure that the Warrens managed to corner that market. I mean, are there other haunted museums? Absolutely, but theirs is really the one that started it all. One of these allegedly satanically involved items you can find hiding about are a series of tombstones that the Warrens claim were used in a dark occult ritual by those who work on the darker side of the paranormal. However, what makes these tombstones especially creepy is that they reportedly belong to rather young people. And so the Warrens had reason to believe that the young people were not not only used as a sacrifice, but then their tombstones were used to finalize the ritual. So, you know, just all around very dark and evil stuff. Coming in at number six, a brick. It's not all Hollywood-based sensations inside the museum. In fact, one of their most prized and feared possessions looks about as plain as you could imagine. It's a brick. Like, from a house. But of course, this is no ordinary brick. It's in an occult museum after all. This brick in particular was from the Borley Rectory, a now famous building that was demolished in 1944 after it was badly damaged in a fire. But what made it such a sensation was that prior to the 1939 fire, it had long been rumored to be the most haunted building in all of the United Kingdom which is a pretty tall order considering how many allegedly haunted buildings span across the UK. Allegedly, the night of the fire, there were over 2,000 reports of paranormal activity, including floating bricks thought to have been possessed by a poltergeist. So if rumors are true, that would make this brick probably the most terrifying brick ever, which I mean, I don't know how much competition it really has there, but still, it's a demonic brick. It's terrifying no matter what. Coming in at number five, pearls of death. While it's probably a pretty safe blanket rule that you shouldn't go around touching much of anything you find in Ed and Lorraine's demonic collection, some stuff is probably a little worse than others. And this next one falls into the latter category. Notoriously one of the most dangerous items found inside the museum, the Pearls of Death is a cursed necklace said to do exactly as the name suggests. Allegedly, anyone who dares place them around their neck will be choked and suffocated to death. Now, my question about this necklace is, is it like a Frodo and the Ring style situation where it will call to you, slowly infecting your brain through mind control until it practically forces you to place it around your neck? Or does it just wait for someone to unknowingly do it before it unleashes all hell on the victim? I guess I will never know, because you can bet I won't be testing it out for myself. Coming in at number four, The Conjuring Mirror. 
Despite what the name would have you believe, The Conjuring Mirror actually has really nothing to do with The Conjuring movies. Instead, this haunted mirror gets its name from the fact that it was, at one point, allegedly used to summon or conjure spirits. Once in the possession of a man named Stephen Zellner, legend has it that Stephen practiced a kind of witchcraft known as catoprotromancy, I probably butchered that, in order to see into the future and seek out revenge on his enemies. However, the more that Stephen used the mirror, the more and more corrupt he and his use of the magic became. Eventually, it's said the evil spirits he had conjured to do his bidding became too powerful to control and turned on the very person who had summoned them. Soon, Stephen began fearing for his life, so as a last resort, he decided to reach out to a local priest to see if the evil spirits could be exorcised from the home. But instead, the priest put him in touch with Ed and Lorraine. Upon their arrival at Stephen's home, they immediately knew Stephen was in grave trouble. And so to keep him safe, they performed a reverse incantation spell to seal up all the spirits back inside the mirror from which they had been conjured. Afterwards, Stephen begged them to take the mirror away from him, and that is how it came to live in Ed and Lorraine's museum. However, don't get too comfortable. Despite the spell they cast, Ed and Lorraine still claim to have experienced many terrifying moments with the spirits they angered from trapping inside the smear. And who knows what could bring them back out. Coming in at number three, the shadow doll. When it comes to creepy dolls, I'll be honest, it doesn't take much to freak me out. But with that being said, there is definitely a very good reason why the shadow doll is one of the most feared possessions in the entire museum. Now, what starts off this seemingly endless list of creepy things about this doll is that there is no definitive answer as to why it was created or who created it. But according to Ed and Lorraine's files, it was made using both human and animal bones and was absolutely used in satanic rituals. So it is definitely possessed by some less than ideal company. Said to have been found in an antique shop by a couple, they began to think something was wrong after they kept waking up night after night covered in inexplicable scratches. But it wasn't until the doll began showing up in their nightmares, telling them that she was going to kill them, that they decided to get rid of the terrifying toy. And good thing they did too. Legend has it that if someone takes a picture of this doll, she will visit you in your dreams and kill you in your sleep. Just one more reason to never trust a creepy doll. Coming in at number two, a satanic idol. As the story goes, in 1991, a hunter was walking through the woods on the lookout for deer when he began to feel an overwhelming sense of paranoia like he was being watched or something. At that very moment, he turned around to see this creepy doll leaned up against a tree, staring at him, and he could have sworn that it appeared out of nowhere. Immediately, the hunter knew he should not be here, and so he began walking as quickly as he could to find a way out of the forest. Then suddenly, an old man dressed in all black robes appeared beside him. He looked like a priest, the hunter thought, but something wasn't quite right. Every step he took, the priest matched him, and eventually he became so freaked out, he actually debated shooting at the priest with his arrow to scare him off. But instead, he decided to ask the priest how to get out of the forest. But creepily, the priest did not speak. Instead, he pointed off into another direction, turned around, and left the man alone once again. Now, luckily, the hunter escaped, and the following day, after telling his friends the strange events, they suggested that he reach out to Ed and Lorraine. Upon telling them his story, they explained that the priest was a well-known leader of a satanic cult, and that the creepy doll he had encountered was actually an idol used for ritual purposes. However, the Warrens, being who they were, wanted to get this idol for the museum, and so Ed ventured into the forest, found the doll, and brought it back home. 
Soon after, however, strange things began happening. Allegedly, one time Ed was speaking with Lorraine, turned away for a second, looked back, and she was suddenly 30 feet away and passed out on the ground. He called the ambulance, and she spent the next three days in hospital in and out of consciousness. And according to Ed, she actually levitated while in the hospital. The Warrens always firmly believed that the satanic priest was working through the doll Ed had taken from the forest and was trying to punish them for taking it. Let's just hope no one was ever hospitalized after that. And last up in our number one spot, Annabelle. You didn't really think I was gonna do a list about haunted things found in Ed and Lorraine's museum and not bring up the famous Annabelle, did you? Although nowadays she is locked up tight, this wasn't always the case. Back in 1970, Annabelle was gifted to a nursing student named Donna, but it didn't take long before Donna and her roommate Angie knew that something was off. After about a month, the roommates began finding disturbing messages lying around their apartment, warning them to help Lou. Lou was one of their friends who had apparently warned the girls of the doll since day one. Eventually, things got so creepy that the woman contacted a medium who told them not to be afraid that the doll was merely possessed by a young girl named Annabelle Higgins who had died on the property years prior. The medium advised them that Annabelle felt safe here and would like to stay, so they agreed. But that was all a part of the demon's plan. Not long after, Lou stayed over, and when he awoke from a nightmare, he found he couldn't move his body. And then, like straight out of a horror movie, he says Annabelle walked up his body and strangled him until he passed out. After that, the girls contacted a priest who put them in touch with paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who discredited the medium and said it was, in fact, a very dangerous demon possessing this doll. However, even now, despite being locked up, the doll should be deeply feared. It was reported once that a man who visited the museum mocked the doll and only a few days later died after losing control of his motorbike. So, yeah. She very well could be the most terrifying doll on the planet. Ancient well, Egyptian power tools. We all know how smart the ancient Egyptians must have been, but with their pyramids we couldn't even recreate today if we tried. But with this recent discovery, it seems like these dudes were more technologically advanced than we could have possibly imagined. So this researcher Christopher Dunn was basically Sherlock's homing his way through the remnants of the pyramids, looking at how the ancient builders must have made their stuff, and what he found was seriously mind-boggling. But to the untrained eye, it seems pretty innocuous. Just a simple ribbed core which would have been drilled out from the limestone and discarded during the pyramid's creation. Now those grooves you see when something's been cut. Now, now Dunn noticed these grooves on the sarcophagus in the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, but they weren't just any grooves, they were similar to what our modern band saws make. See the thing is, the distance between these grooves were teeny teeny tiny, about 0 .05 of an inch. It's like trying to fit an ant between them. Now, nowadays, for us to get those marks, our tools would need to move way slower, but there's more. See, those ancient Egyptians weren't just good at grooving. They were drilling into granite like it was a piece of cake. The drilling technique, which was thought of as trepanning, left behind cores. Now, here's the mind-blowing part. Their drill went into the rock at a crazy rate of 0.1 inch per spin. Today, even with our modern diamond drills spinning at 900 revolutions per minute, we can only manage about 0.0002 inches per spin. It's a whopping 500 times slower than what the ancient Egyptian builders were doing. This means that the Egyptians had access to drilling tools that are more sophisticated than today's technology would allow. So either those dudes back then are smarter than we are, or they were assisted by time travelers from the future. Or both. Probably both. At number 9 is this 1.8 billion year old nuclear reactor. One, so almost 2 billion years ago, that's billion with a B, when humans weren't even a thought, let alone a species, there might have been a nuclear reactor just chilling in Gabon, Africa. Pretty crazy. In the 70s, these French cats bought some uranium back from there, thinking it was just regular stuff, but as it turns out, it had already been activated and mined. 
cue the detective music. Now scientists went Sherlock on this and found out that this place used to be a full-blown nuclear reactor for 500,000 years. And here's where it gets even nuttier. Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg, a big shot in nuclear science, like I'm talking Nobel Prize winning level over here, he said, hold up, this nuclear reactor can't be a natural formation. Why? Because for uranium to go nuclear, it needs conditions so picky you would think it was a diva. The water needs to be insanely clean, like way cleaner than usual. Plus, there's this special isotope called U-235 that's crucial for the party to start. The uranium-235 isotope levels here were just not enough for a natural nuclear rave. The U-235 levels found in this ancient reactor weren't actually high enough to kickstart this atomic party. So think about it. A nuclear reactor before humanity was even a thing. Time travel vibes or what? This artifact throws textbooks out the window. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. Number eight, this 2.8 billion year old sphere. It's even older than the reactor. So imagine stumbling upon these tiny round things in, South, in a South African mine, thinking that they're just kind of cute little rocks. But no, some folks argue that they might be the ultimate proof that time travel is real. Known as the Clark's Drop Spheres are like celebrities of the geology world. People debate whether or not they're natural or handmade by ancient humans. Now here's the kicker. Well, it wouldn't be ancient humans because it's far older than our species. But here's the kicker. These guys have neat grooves on their surface and they're tougher than tough, not even being able to be scratched with steel pretty wild, kind of makes you wonder how those grooves were even put there in the first place. These spheres are older than old, like 2.8 billion years ancient, which is super mind-boggling. But here's where the mystery deepens. See, nobody's really sure how these things were formed. Some say they're formed by nature, but those grooves in that hardness, it's a really tough nut to crack. Now this debate is huge. If these spheres were made by prehistoric monkey people back in ancient times, it's a game changer for the history books. But if nature is the artist here, well, it's one tricky piece of Earth's history's puzzle that we're still trying to figure out. These spheres might hold the key to unlocking some incredible secrets of our past. At number seven are the 150,000 year old pipes. Pipes, yeah, like the ones for plumbing, just chilling in this cave that dates back 150,000 years. That's way before our great, 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 great grandparents were even a twinkle in somebody's eye. And even way before the ancient Romans figured out how plumbing works. But here's the kicker. When experts took a closer look at these pipes, they found something mind-boggling. About 8% of the material used to make these pipes couldn't be identified whatsoever. It's like trying to figure out what's in a secret sauce recipe, but with may more mystery involved. But there's more! These pipes aren't your run-of-the-mill kind. They're actually a bit on the radioactive side. Yeah, pipes that emit radioactivity kind of wonders what... Kind of makes you wonder what the people putting through those pipes. Some... Kind of makes you wonder what was in their diet. Uh, the, now, this isn't your everyday plumbing material. A geology expert thinks that maybe these pipes were formed when super hot stuff from way down in the Earth's belly rose up and solidified into tubes, which sounds plausible, but even this, but even this expert scratched their head and admitted that there's something pretty strange going on here. So these pipes could be the breadcrumbs hinting at the possibility of time travel being more than just a sci-fi dream. They're like a sneak peek into a world we thought only existed in wild sci-fi movies, but hey, mystery remains unsolved. And number six, the glorification of the Eucharist from the late 16th century. Ventura selling Benny's painting in the church of St. Peter Montalcino. It's in Italy. It's a head scratcher for sure. Imagine this, the experts, all knowledgeable about art history, were trying to explain this weird spherical thing in the painting that's what's supposed to be a creation globe, and the wand-like objects that are being held by Jesus Christ and God are symbols of divine power, but here's where it gets really interesting. Have you guys ever heard of Sputnik? That was the very first satellite sent into space by the Soviets way back in 57. Now picture this. There's a replica of Sputnik sitting pretty in the National Air and Space Museum, and when you get the painting and the Sputnik and you put them side by side, they're literally twins, separated by centuries. Same size, same shine, even down to the little prong. 
Now, some folks entertain the wild idea that maybe Sputnik did a quick time travel stint swinging back to the 16th century. Others, though, they lean towards the UFO theory. Yeah, thing in the painting might just be a unidentified flying object. But here's the kicker. The mystery remains unsolved. Is this due to time travel? Is it UFOs? Jury's still out on this one, waiting for a Sherlock Holmes of the art world to crack open this case. Time travel? Maybe. UFOs? Possibly. At number five are the Nazca Lines. These massive drawings sp sprawling across the Peruvian desert are seriously something else. They've been around for more than 1,500 years. Just imagine, back when there were no smartphones or drones, these ancient folks managed to create giant images that you could only fully appreciate from up in the sky. Now, the variety of these drawings, the animals, the shapes, and the designs are so precise, it's hard to believe that they were made without some kind of aerial guidance. Some folks think that they represent constellations, or maybe sort of homage to gods, but the mystery here is still unsolved. In 2022, archaeologists stumbled upon 150 new Nazca lines. I mean, you'd think after all these years with Google Earth and, si and satellites and whatnot, we'd at least found them all by now. But no, these discoveries just keep adding more questions. At number four is the Iron Pillar of Delhi. This thing has perplexed experts for ages. I mean, we're talking about an iron column that has stood tall for at least 1,500 years. Some even speculate that it might be older than that. And here's the kicker. Despite all those years, it's rust-free. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. This pillar is 99.72% pure iron. It's impressive by today's standards even. I'm talking about a level of purity that even modern experts struggle to achieve. They've tried to replicate it and they can't crack the code. And get this, and they can't crack the code as even our iron is only like 99.8% pure iron, which is like 0.8% more, which is crazy. But what's even crazier is that it doesn't have any of the usual suspects found in modern high-grade iron like manganese and sulfur. It's just a pure iron anomaly. The grave Naki sews of an enthroned woman with an attendant from 100 BC. This stone carving from over 2,000 years ago depicts a strange sight. A kid holding what looks like a laptop in front of a person seated on a throne. The artwork, chilling at the Getty Villa in Los Angeles, got some folks scratching their heads. The museum even claims this box is a container, yet one that's far too shallow to hold anything big. Now some say it's a jewelry box or a makeup box, comparing it to other stuff that... Now some say it's a jewelry or a makeup box, but what if it's not? Imagine if the folks who built the... Pe Imagine if the folks who sculpted this used high-tech software like, Auto uh, like AutoCAD on their MacBook which sounds pretty bonkers. This artifact seems to raise eyebrows because it's familiar to our tech, but it's from way, way back. At number two is the 2,000 year old batteries. Imagine stumbling upon a set of ancient jars, which would be pretty cool on its own, but these aren't just any old jars, mind you. They're like the ancestors of modern day batteries. Picture clay jars decked out with asphalt stoppers and iron rods, kicking it, um, all the, kicking it from all the way back from 2,000 years ago. This convites consists of a clay vessel, inside which is a copper cylinder held in place by asphalt. And within the cylinder, archaeologists found an oxidized iron rod. So back in 1938, this German archaeologist named William, named Willem Koenig suggested that these could be galvanic cells, perhaps used for electroplating gold onto silver objects. Nobody could prove the do wrong, especially since all you need was to fill it with acid or alkaline all, uh, considering all you needed to do was fill it with an acid or an alkaline substance to produce an electric charge. These jars, let's call them ancient batteries, can actually whip up more electricity than you'd expect, turning out just over a volt, which is pretty shocking, pun intended. Now, the battery wouldn't have been a very effective one, but still, ancient batteries. At number one, let's dive into these ancient paintings. First is the Madonna with Saint Giovanni. This painting is famous for having a blob-like thing in the sky. I mean, we have Mary, baby Jesus, St. John just chilling in a classic 15th century scene, but where is that disc-shaped blob to the right of Mary? It's got a guy and a dog staring at it. Some peeps speculate that this might be more than just the holy family going on here. Some think that those beings might be from outer space. Imagine that, extraterrestrials, photobombing, photobombing a centuries-old painting. Now, this other painting, the inoculation with Saint Emedius, is a whole different story. This masterpiece illustrates the Gabriel angel giving Mary the heads up about baby Jesus. But hold up! In this painting, it appears like Mary's receiving the news from a beam of light coming from a strange otherworldly object. Uh, some folks got way out there suggesting that Mary might have had an otherworldly encounter leading to her pregnancy with Jesus. So was Christ an alien? Probably. As Want more videos like this one? Check out this video right here.
It's about UFO encounters the government doesn't want you to know about. That's right, Sleepy Joe Biden is hiding this information from you. Click the video now to find out more.